As Bruce mentioned, I work for Alberta Agriculture. I've been in Alberta now for about five years. I grew up originally from Saskatchewan. By my calculations, if it wasn't for Saskatchewan, I think Alberta would have about two million less people. Um, the joke always was in Saskatchewan and still is, the uh, last person that's leaving for Alberta shut the lights off. So uh, there I grew up on a farm. We had a small mixed farm. Uh, I enjoyed the pleasures of being kicked by angry cows and uh, yeah, shoveling, shoveling out pig manure out of the barn and stuff. So I left the farm uh, after, some, after some stuff happened there, went and did some university, left there, went into the crop industry. That's my background is mainly crops. I worked for a crop company in southern Saskatchewan as their marketing manager for a number of years. Then I went and worked for the Saskatchewan government for a while, went back to school, went back to school and uh, came here uh, once the scholarship money ran out and once the money ran out from selling my house, I came here because I needed a job. I started off as a crops economist here in Alberta. About three years ago, I switched over to, uh, to doing the uh, livestock stuff. So uh, it's been quite good, I think. And uh, so today's presentation, I'm going to go through, uh, going to talk about some market factors, kind of have a graph that kind of shows how we went up to that peak price and then what's some of the stuff that's brought us back down from there. Talk about some stuff about the beef herd on the beef supply and demand side and then look at a few slides on feed prices, just sort of what's happening there, and then talk about market outlook. And then I'm looking at some marketing alternatives. I was asked to go through that and just look at maybe some of the numbers behind retained ownership and, and uh, keeping calves on the farm this year. So this is the, going back to January of 2000, this is the nearby live and cattle features uh, numbers for finishing at the end of each. Uh, this is a daily chart. So. You can see here we had back in 2003 that the BSC event that kind of brought prices down. The market recovered. And then it was fairly flat through here. Uh, we had the renewable fuel standards come in in the U.S. We saw corn prices go up. We had some bad crops in there. We prices came up and down in southern Alberta. Prices were up and then they were kind of down and then they were back up here again. Then we had the economic meltdown in 2009 that brought cattle prices down, but we started to recover because suddenly we had the U.S. drought, cattle numbers were falling, we weren't seeing any cattle uh, expansion here in Canada. We had low beef numbers, prices kept going up, and then they kind of settled off here in about 2013. Uh, kind of looked like the market had figured out what it wanted to do, and then we had pet V and hogs, we had 8 million piglets die in the U.S. Uh, they tried getting that back online, really affected their breeding stock down there. That pushed prices up because suddenly we had a shortage of pork. Maybe we had avian influenza. We had, I think it was 55 million birds called in the US. Uh, that brought prices up for eggs and for poultry. Then we had low feed costs in there. That brought prices down. And then on the flip side, coming back down, we had the West Coast port strike for, I think that went on for nine months. So we had a bunch of meat piling up in the freezers here in North America. Then we had pork and poultry production come back online pretty quick. They were able to ramp back up once they got those diseases uh, figured out. Then we had beef production come up. And beef production came up because through all of this, we saw that uh, carcass weights were increasing. Uh, just looking at this year, even though we've, we're seeing carcass weights come down, in Canada, our average carcass weight is still 920 pounds. That's 38 pounds above where we were last year, and it's 52 pounds above the five-year average. So we have all of these factors going on here and with these increased carcass weights, it really hasn't, we've seen a, a small percentage drop in, uh, in beef production, but that, that increase in carcass rates has really offset a lot of that decrease in slaughter and, and beef production. And then lastly, we have the global economy that's been slowing down and that's affected drop credit, those byproducts into Asian stuff, hide markets came down, we saw, we saw markets for tallow and stuff, those prices have come off. And I have a slide later on that kind of shows how that's affected what the return, you know, with that money going back into the packer, which affects the price that we all see here. So these are kind of the factors that I put together here that show us so we've got volatility in the futures market, byproduct values, those are struggling, we're starting to see some recovery now, high prices are starting to get a floor under them, some demand coming back into Asia. Carcass weights are up. We've got beef, poultry, and pork production up. The U.S. has ramped up really fast, got historically high coal storage rates, 
retail prices. I've got a slide on this. It's kind of interesting. It's U.S. data, but it shows sort of that return at the farm level compared to the wholesale compared to the retail level. Domestic consumption is trending lower. That's kind of a two-sided story. And then, but demand is remaining strong. Even though prices are up, demand is still remaining strong. And I could end the presentation here and we can all sit and have coffee, but. So on the beef herd side, uh, this is just, I wanted to kind of show that no two cattle cycles are the same. And these are cattle cycles going back to the late 60s is, the, is where I started. So we had this peak here in 75. Then we kind of went back into liquidation and consolidation in the 80s. Kind of peaked, or in the 70s, sorry. Peaked in 82, peaked again in 97. And then we had this forced peak in 2005. And I kind of started here in 2012. I thought it's time to start another cattle cycle, even though our numbers aren't up, our total cattle numbers are up, and that's kind of more to do with dairy and, and some of those other activities. But I think we're actually still trailing off here on this, on this 2012. Uh, I think we're still going here because we're just not increasing the beef herd in Canada or Alberta. Uh, we're still seeing those numbers go down. So I just, I guess the story here is nothing is actually typical for a, for a beef cycle. Uh, compare that to the U.S. They peaked in 75, and since then their herd has been coming down until 2014. I mean, they had some other peaks here, similar, 82, 96, 2006. And then they were down here at about 29 million head in 2012, or sorry, yeah, 2014, sorry. Uh, then they started to ramp up. They added a few. 2016, they're up to about 30 million head. Then they're supposed to be up another 1 to 1.2 million head for 2017, and a further 600,000 head for 2018 is what the projections are. So they're trying to slow down on their expansion, but it's going to take a while to get that, uh, that expansion to slow down in, 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 in response to dropping beef prices. So this is the, just showing where U.S. cattle inventory and, and heifer retention is. You can see here that heifer retention's really started to drop off. Um, they're really trying to slow that down but still you're gonna see this increase in cattle numbers into 2018 just as they slowly get that down, bring more of those heifers are brought in on feed, and then also that they're called out of the herd. On the Canadian side, so yeah, so those are the estimates there for, for the US. On the Canadian side, you can see we've just been flat here. Um, looking at how many heifers have been slaughtered, how many heifers have been exported live, how many have gone in for placements. My sort of initial guess is that we're going to be up maybe less than 1% in the Canadian inventory. Um, it's just basically looking at those feeders that have gone out. There is some heifers sitting out there. It just depends on whether or not they actually end up in the herd. For Alberta, we had this peak here in 2005. So we're down about 25% into 2016. I've had some conversations with people about whether this peak would have actually happened if, if the border hadn't closed. Um, maybe we were never supposed to be there, but uh, that, that's our peak. Then we're down to here, and right now, you know, we're at some of the lowest numbers in 25 years. The U.S. before they expanded was at some of the lowest numbers in 50 to 60 years. So these are all contributing factors to how that, in that first chart, how that price really spiked. And maybe that, that spike that we saw shouldn't have been, or that price increase shouldn't have been as high as it was uh, if we didn't, wouldn't have had these other factors going on with pigs and, and poultry and, and then the such low uh, beef numbers. So this is heifer retention. This is kind of interesting. Uh, when I look at this chart, I see, well, we've been the last three years, we've been retaining more heifers. We should be expanding, but we've been culling pretty hard. Seven of the last 10 years, our cull rate here in Alberta has been above the 20 year average. And we're still culling hard. This year, uh, they're saying that we're going to be still above that long-term average of around 11%. And that's what I just take away from this is that, you know, we just have a really young herd. We've got a lot of heifers coming in, but we've got a lot of old cows that we're getting rid of. And uh, that, I guess that's a good thing to have a young herd, but at the same time, at some point, we got to, you know, if, if we want to build the herd, we've got to stop. You know, we got to keep this number up, but we got to slow down on our culling rate of the older cows. In the U.S., uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that right now they're at about a 44% ratio on the cull rate of cows to 
Uh, it's the number of cows in the herd. Once they hit about 48%, then we'll really start to see their numbers come down in the U.S. on the, on the beef herd side. So this has uh, been talking a little bit about uh, the percentage of heifers that are placed into feedlots. Coming into 2015, things look really, really good. We had this, we were down below 20%. Prices were good, they were increasing. It looked like we were gonna expand. April came, didn't really have any, you know, very much moisture. Then May came and June came and the pastures were really bad. Then we started increasing our percentage of heifers going into the feedlot. Come into 2015, or 2016, sorry, looks again pretty good, we're down at 25%, but then prices are dropping, weather conditions are so-so, and we just ramped up the number of heifers going into the feedlots here. This is for Alberta and Saskatchewan terminal feedlots, feedlots greater than 1,000 head. We peaked at 65% in June, um, and then that number sort of maintained here around 42 to 44% since then. So we're placing a lot of heifers in the feedlot, and there's a rule that I've been told, an unwritten rule, that if you're above 40%, it implies that the herd is contracting. Um, I guess that you know, could be proven to be true. I guess it really depends on how many of those feeders that we're not exporting are kept here. Or it might go back into the herd, but you know, above four, at these rates, it would imply that we're not gonna grow again this year. If you, if you just look at that one rule based on the number of feedlot placements, it kind of gives the indication that that's probably not this year again, we're not gonna expand. Slaughter side, we've only, we're only slaughtering a few more heifers this year, one and a half percent. Cows were still up 8%, this was to mid-October, and steers were up 8%. So overall in Canada, we slaughtered about 6% more cows, or cattle, I guess. In the US, we're just under 6%. And then this is the export side here. So on, on live exports, feeders were down, uh, were down about 39% uh, from last year and about 15% from the five-year average. So we're not far off from the five-year average. When the U.S. was rebuilding, these were kind of exceptional years. They needed, they needed cattle in their feedlots, and it gave us an opportunity to export those down there. Uh, so now we're kind of returning more to that historical average. On the Fed side, we're still about you know, that same 15% below the five-year average, but we're 47% above where we were last year. What I've been told is that a lot of these are cattle that have been contracted, and that's why they're going down there. And later on, I'm gonna talk about basis and sort of see how, even though these cattle are going down there, we sort of have a, a local basis that implies that maybe we, you know, they're trying to keep some of those here for slaughter as well. So on the beef side, Cattle on feed numbers are down 17% from last year. This rate here is the third lowest number of cattle on feed since reporting began. I believe reporting began in 2000. Um, I might be, I could be wrong on that date, but our third lowest number of cattle on feed. Our marketings are up substantially in the last couple months. Feedlots are becoming more current in their inventory, and that's just that pull to get more cattle into the slaughter plant. Packer margins are incredibly positive right now. I was looking at some numbers out of the U.S. They're estimating that U.S. packer margins last week were positive $180 a head. Compare that to, um, you know, and then, and then also on the hog side, they had, they're seeing positive margins too right now. Hog, hog slaughter plants are about that 36 or sorry, 42 bucks a head is what they had last week out of the US. July through September placements are down 20% compared to last year. So we're marketing more, we're placing less, and now we've got about less than 600,000 head, about 580,000 head on feed in Alberta and Saskatchewan compared to where we should be. And even once we get up to, to full capacity here, you know, when you look when we're in January, December, when we usually have the maximum numbers on feed, we still have lots of pen space open. Uh, we have about 1.2 million pen spaces, so we still have space to put more cattle on feed. So there should be a big pull here, and you can see that in the feeder cattle basis right now for Alberta on the spot basis. There is a pull to get more cattle into these feedlots here. 
Over time, we've just seen our numbers decrease on cattle on feed, and I, this pretty much coincides or it would be pretty close to what we're seeing with the decrease in cattle numbers. So we just keep decreasing until we're at this low here. In the US, they've been more erratic following increases in, in feed costs, decreases in feed costs. And then you can see in 2012 with that drought, how their numbers dropped off as they called heavily, brought the herd down, and then since 2014, those cattle on feed numbers have been increasing. So on the beef supply side, and this is where I was saying for, you can see in 2016 here, even though our slaughter numbers are up somewhat, uh, and this was a more of, I think, a better story in 2015, you could really see that that increase in carcass weights as, as feeders fed those cows longer, kept them on feed longer because it was cheaper to feed what you had than it was to buy something. You can see how we're producing more meat in 2016 and we're going to produce more meat in 2017. Year to date, we're up just under 2.5% in Canada. It's the same in the U.S. Where the U.S. has really taken off is in their beef numbers. They're 5%. Uh, we'll have more beef, uh, produce estimated 5% more beef in 2014, or 2016, sorry, or 2015. And then next year, they're going to have another 3% increase in, in total meat production. And this plays into those, uh, what I mentioned earlier, with we have our freezer space is maxed out right now. We've got historically high meat and freezer space in North America and that's pushing those prices down as well. Even though we're seeing exports increasing, we still have a lot of meat to move, and that meat is playing on the, is playing on the cattle prices. So meat consumption in Canada, this is kind of a, this is per capita availability. It's just an estimation of, of what there is available for meat, um, because this is how much meat we have per person that they could eat. I don't think this, it's, a, it's an indication of what people could eat. Um, I know myself that uh, I don't, do not eat uh, 32 kilograms of chicken in a year. Um, but, you know, maybe some people, that would be correct. On the beef side here, going back to 87, just for where this chart is, we're down 33%. If you take this back into the 70s, we're down closer to 50% on the, on the beef availability per person. Pork, we're down 25% since 87. That's sort of when this peaked on this chart. And then chicken's just been steadily increasing. The amount of chicken that's available per person is up 50%, and it just keeps increasing year after year after year. So this is grocery store prices. And the next chart I have after this is the chart I was talking about that kind of shows everybody talks and, and what I've always been told is the packer holds the power in the supply chain. I've maintained for quite a while it's not the packer. Um, we had a conversation yesterday where one of my colleagues said it probably never was, the, it was never was the packer, it's always been the retailer who holds the power. So these prices year over year, this is Canadian prices and then in brackets I have the US equivalent for the same product and how much their prices have decreased. So for a sirloin steak here in Canada, we're down about 1% from a year ago. These prices go into uh, August, I believe. Um, so we're down about 1% in the US, they're down 3%. Ground beef, we're only down 4% here, but we're down 11% in the US. So the US has gone really good on bringing prices down, but a lot of it's been featuring. They've been featuring products at the grocery store level and really starting to push that beef through the, through the retail uh, through the retail options there. Pork chops are down 3%, just to, to give an indication, but 7.5% in the U.S. Um, chicken's down 2% here, down 4% in the U.S. There was a lot of talk that chicken should have come down more in price, just because the amount of chicken that's there, the export problems they've been having, and there's a lot of chicken sitting in, especially in the U.S. market. Bacon, um, we love bacon here. That's the only reason I can explain the 4% increase. Uh, in the U.S. it's dropped 4%, but I think we have better bacon in Canada. I've eaten bacon in the U.S. and it's not the same. Uh, this 4% increase might be something related to diets. We're wrapping everything in bacon now. Even the beef we wrap in bacon and, and eat it. So, seafood wrapped in bacon. So, okay, I guess I kind of messed up here. We're getting there, we're getting there. Um, so here, you know, we have beef prices down to average, these ones maybe 2% in Canada. But the Canadian cutouts declined 25%, and that's just since January. It would be even higher, we're probably up around 28 to 30% if you can look at the peak back in 2015. 
So just since January, we've given up $75 a hundred weight on the cutout, but we've only given up a little bit at the retail level. The cutout is going to continue to decrease. There's going to be a little bit more pressure here, but then there's going to be some increase in the cutout, and that's just going to do with the fact that we don't have enough fed animals to feed the slaughter plants in the next three months. Especially in the U.S., they're looking at shortages of fed animals, fat, fat cattle, and they're projecting this, this number will come up here a bit on the cutout, and then, but then once we get into the spring next year, then we're going to see that. And you can see that in the futures prices as well. So this is U.S. data. The blue line is the net farm value of beef. The red line is the wholesale value of that beef. And the green line is the retail value. So since 1970 to 2015, the retail value has gone from $0.37 cent spread to a $3.38 cent spread. So there's been a $3 increase in that spread at the retail level. On the wholesale, the spread's gone from 14 and a half to 52 and a half. So wholesale's not really pulling in much more margin, but the retailers sure are. You can see when beef prices spike anywhere in here, the retailer gives back a little bit, but not near as much. And then that price just keeps increasing. Between, for, for this difference here in the spread, that's about 900, that's over 900% increase in their margin at the retail level. The retailers give a lot of um, talk to saying that they're trying right now to recapture margins they lost as beef prices went up. Um, I guess, I guess that's good. I guess that's that's their business plan. It works well. Um, I think if a lot of us weren't in this industry, and when you look at general consumers, they're not going to know this difference. They're only going to see what they see in the media and they're gonna, they don't know the actual price of a fat cow, they don't know the price of, of, of wholesale beef, they just know when they go to the store and they want to buy a package of good steaks that they're going to pay 40 bucks. So they're, on this last cattle price here, we're down about 8% at retail for total U.S., that's an average of all, all beef in the supermarket. But the wholesale price is down 23% and at the farm level it's down 31%. So there's a huge difference here and that's why I continue to think that it's not the packer the retailer maintains the power in the supply chain and they're probably going they're going to keep that power in the supply chain um, they tell us what we're going to eat they tell us our, they tell us the serving sizes we're going to eat and they tell us the products we're going to eat this is beef demand in Canada so I've just done just to try and get a, it's an index price and it's just to kind of show how even though the, the availability of the per capita consumption is down, it's not down what we would expect it to be. So the index from 2014 to 15 jumped 14%. The index price for beef jumped. But consumption only dropped 7.6%. When you look from 2013 to 15, it becomes even more apparent. The index price went up 27%, but we only saw an 11% decrease in consumption or that per capita availability. And people are still buying beef. They still like it, they still want it. There's a big difference between barbecuing a pork chop and barbecuing a steak. Um, and there's a big difference between eating a chicken burger and eating a beef burger. Um, I was telling a story yesterday, there's a company down in California that has produced a vegetable or a different type of protein burger. They've captured some of the flavor aspects of beef and they've, they've made this sort of synthetic beef flavor and when the burger is raw if you cut it open it actually looks red and it can bleed if they put enough of this flavoring or enough of this so, it, it, so it's a protein burger made out of soybeans and, and vegetables and stuff and it looks just like beef supposedly it's supposed to taste like beef because they've captured the flavor of beef in this synthetic synthetic type uh, flavoring uh, packet or whatever um, that's changing things and that's changing people's perception of, of what, you know, and what consumers want. And that, that change in consumer taste is something we're going to have to, it's going to continue to happen. And we're probably going to continue to see this consumption drop uh, for, for beef anyways. And, and probably for other products as people want to taste other things or they want, or they think they want to do other things that are um, maybe less protein-based products. On the trade side, 
our uh, net trade. We, we've decreased our imports or decreased our our imports from the U.S. and increased our exports. So our net trade with the U.S. is up on beef. We'll probably see that continue to increase. Uh, Australia was shipping a lot of beef into, you know, over the last few years, they've been shipping a lot of beef into the U.S., maxing out their TRQ limits by October, November. Now, after four or five years of severe drought, they have gotten rain, pasture conditions have improved. Now they're on a really strong herd rebuilding in, in, in Australia. So we're likely going to be able to export, whoops, export more meat into the U.S. here. It's also going to give us an opportunity, and I'll get to this here right now, to go after markets like Japan. Australia has preferential, they have, they have no, or very low duties or no dirty duties into Japan. Because of the decrease, they're about 25% down in slaughter. They're going to have decreased exports into these markets. It's going to give us an opportunity, even though we have to pay duty going into Japan, we can go after that market. But we're also going to have to compete with the U.S. because they're going to go after those high value markets as well. For Alberta, we represent about 78% of Canada's total beef exports. Our top five are the U.S., China, Mexico, Hong Kong, and Japan. Um, depending on what happens next Tuesday and who gets the new presidential race and, or who's our new uh, next door neighbor, uh, we might end up with a wall, so we'll have to, I guess, throw the beef over the wall. Uh, for, for Canada, uh, we have the same top five exports, uh, obviously with Alberta representing 78% of, of beef exports. Um, you know, we lead, we lead the way for, for Canada, and that would be true since we finished 70% of the cattle in Canada. It would only make sense that we're the top exporter. So on to feed prices. Uh, you guys would know this better than me, but these prices are based out of Lethbridge. Uh, these are uh, elevator bid prices. You can see barley's crept up here in October, up about five bucks a ton. That's just based on the crappy harvest we've had. I've heard reports of mold and things coming in into the feed. Those are things that are gonna have to be watched, so we might see a further increase in, in barley prices. I know this chart here, this is average forage price or 50% mix alfalfa hay price for Alberta. I was asked by somebody where they can buy six cent per pound hay. Um, this is just an average, and I use this chart. I know it's off by probably, you know, it's off by a lot. Prices are up, you know, more up probably four or five cents per pound higher, but it's just an indication of where things are going. So you can see here, again, with that harvest problems that we've been seeing, we've seen an increase or a small increase in hay prices, and those might continue to increase for good quality forage. Looking at uh, comparing Lethbridge barley and Omaha corn, we're at a feeding disadvantage. The USDA, even though they just said that corn, they knocked it down a bushel per acre, that kind of had a little bit of an increase on corn prices here recently. Corn prices have come back down. We still have huge ending stock ratios for corn. China is upset over steel, so they've slapped on a 33% duty onto DDG prices going from the US or, or shipments, uh, US exports of DDGs, dry distillers grains, they've slapped on a 33% tariff. That's gonna drop back the number of DDGs that go into China. They're trying to get rid of all the old corn they have there to get that out. So there's a possibility that this, well there's really good, I don't think it's a possibility, we're gonna stay at a feeding disadvantage here, especially if our barley prices keep creeping up. That just means that we could see the opportunity exists, I know it's, it's difficult too, but the opportunity would exist to bring corn or DDGs up into Canada for feeding. Um, and that's, that's another, another area to watch, is just that our feed prices are higher, so that puts us at a disadvantage to feeding out of the US. So on the market outlook side, what I've done is I've kind of started to look at where we are right now. Then I'll go in and look at some of the prices around projected futures prices, and then go from there, and then we'll go into the marketing alternative stuff. So this was the prices last week for a five weight yearling and a slaughter steer. At a buck 72, we're up about, we're up about six cents from the week before. We're up eight cents last week on the price of a yearling steer for Alberta, 
and then our slaughter steer prices jumped about four cents, or sorry, two and a half cents. Um, so put that in relation to where we've been. Uh, you can see here prices, you know, we crept up as cattle numbers were down, we crept up. We had this peak here. One of the things that happened is that fed prices, fat cattle prices peaked in June of 2015. Then we had our feeder prices didn't peak until September. That peak in September is what kind of, that started when I get to it here on feedlot margins. That's when it became way cheaper to feed the animals you have than it did to feed or buy replacement animals and feed those out. You're buying, your, your incoming stock is higher than, than what you can sell it for. The futures markets become highly unreliable for trying to hedge. So you go out, you buy a pen, you come home, you try to hedge it, and the market's closing almost limit down, two and a half cents, three cents, and you've lost whatever margin you might have had. I was trying to look for some positivity, because this isn't positive. It's not, that's, that's not fun. So I tried to compare it back to where we were in 2013 and 12. Prices were still reasonable then. It seemed reasonable anyways. Um, and when you look at that, we're, we're, not, we're not back at those prices yet. I don't think we're gonna go back there when you look at the futures market now, and, and I do an exercise where I look at those prices and project them. Now I'm actually starting to see those prices are actually leveling out. Before it was always down. It was always going down. Now it's starting to level out. And this would be typical of cattle 